So now I'm going to run through um, as much as I can of genetics in the next 40 minutes. And uh, please speed me up or slow me down and as, as you wish, and don't hesitate to interrupt. Some of this may already be very familiar to you. So the genetic material is uh, deoxyribose nucleic acid. We have known that since 1945, and we've known its structure since 1953. And this is an actually an extremely important point. Genes are solid particles that are transmitted from parent to offspring. They are not fluid. They're actually material stuff, okay? And we know exactly what it is. They encode information uh, as sequences of nucleotides, and in the DNA, it's adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, so you can think of those as four letters. They string into a linear chain to form a molecule, and these, uh, there are two strands that are twisted around each other to form a double helix. So it looks like that. The sugar phosphate strands uh, form the backbone, and then the nucleotides are glued onto the backbone, and they form pairs. So adenine pairs with thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. The sugar phosphate backbone is the same in every DNA molecule on the planet, and the information in the molecule is in the sequence of nucleotides. You can think of that as letters forming words. So uh, these are big molecules. If you were to put all the chromosomes in your nuclei together, and just for one cell, and string them together, one haploid copy is exactly one meter long. So when they say it is a macromolecule, it is a serious macromolecule. It is a big thing. So just chop this piece of measuring tape up into 26 pieces, and you get about the size that you've got in each of your chromosomes. Okay? Uh, when I first isolated DNA from sugarcane and condensed it in ethanol, it came out in the ethanol mixture as a bunch of white stringy strands and I could wrap it around a glass rod. This is big stuff. So we're not talking about tiny, weensy little molecules. DNA is a biggie. And it's very stable. Now, how does this relate to organisms? Well, that's the issue of genotypes and phenotypes, and that's a question of information and matter. So there's a general principle here that's quite intriguing and it has to do with how you turn information into matter. The genotype is basically the info in the DNA. And every cell in your body has got all the information in it that is needed to build a whole organism. That, by the way, is an interesting statement, because if we can overcome some of the genetic programming of, of the oocyte, of the egg, we could, in principle, simply put a cotton swab into your cheek and take one cell off of your cheek and then do fancy reproductive medicine and clone you off of just the DNA in a cheek cell. Now, it turns out that the developmental machinery in the egg is really critical and it's hard to do that. But just from the point of view of the information, any cell in your body could be used to make another you. I can pull out a hair cell, take a cell off of the root of a hair, do the same thing. The phenotype, basically, you should think of that as you, okay? That's the material organism. It's built according to genotypic instructions. So the genotype contains information, the phenotype contains matter, and the transformation from information into matter is done by developmental biology. Decoding that transformation is one of the major research agendas for the 21st century in biology. It's called the construction of the genotype-phenotype map. That's kind of modern jargon for developmental biology. Okay. So where does the DNA actually sit in the cell? Well, here's some more vocabulary. I'm building vocabulary for those of you who haven't been in biology recently. I'm going to say a few words here. In the eukaryotes, the things that have a real nucleus, which includes us and all other multicellular organisms, plus a whole bunch of single-celled ones, they have cells that have a nucleus and the DNA in the nucleus is contained in chromosomes, and these chromosomes are a long structure that has kind of a central scaffold. It's got a central mirror that's labeled two here on the slide. 
And the DNA itself is actually wrapped around proteins in the chromosome. In the prokaryotes, which are the things that lived on this planet for about the first two billion years of life, that is bacteria and archaea, they are single-celled organisms and their DNA is basically not in separate chromosomes but all in one circular loop. So it's a circular chromosome, it's attached to the cell wall. So there's a big difference in the way that eukaryotes and prokaryotes are organized and in fact the eukaryotic nucleus is very probably the evolutionary residue of a prokaryote. That's where that organelle probably came from. Anybody know what the other organelles are that used to be independent organisms? A mitochondrion is one. Chloroplast is another. Not lysosomes. Well, maybe lysosomes. There's a little bit better evidence, though, for another one. Spindle apparatus. The spindle apparatus that pulls the chromosomes apart has a little circular genome associated with it. <laughs> okay, a bit more on chromosomes. The number of chromosomes is usually constant within a species, although there is some variation. You get 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad, so you've got 46 sitting in every cell of your body, except your red blood cells, which don't have a nucleus. That dual set, one from mom and one from dad together, is called the diploid condition. Okay, so DI2, from Greek, diploid. And in contrast to that, your eggs and your sperm are haploid, so the gametes are haploid. They have one set. Haploid means one set of chromosomes. So the haploid number in humans is 23, the diploid number is 46. World record for eukaryotic uh, minimum chromosome number is one. Ascaris, the uh, a nematode that lives in the gut of dogs, has one chromosome. World record for maximum number of chromosomes? Actually, probably also in Ascaris, but in somatic condition. That one chromosome falls into about a thousand pieces when it develops. So, chromosome number varies widely. They've got genes and other things in them. You can think of a chromosome as being about a thousand genes, and you can think of a gene as having several thousand nucleotides in it. And you can think of a gene as being a segment of DNA that tells a cell to make a particular protein, a particular structural RNA, and through splicing and other things, there are various other classes of RNA that are now important, regulatory RNAs. You're made out of proteins and materials whose construction is basically governed by the actions of proteins. And so the DNA in your genome is a set of instructions on how to make what kinds of proteins at certain places and times to control the construction of the organism and determine the uniqueness of the species. This, uh, you know, I've in a few words described something which is incredibly complicated and beautiful. And if you think about how complicated your eyes or your brains or your livers or whatever else is, and you think about that for all of the 10 to 100 million species of organisms on Earth, the amount of information stored in the genomes of the organisms on Earth is just absolutely astounding. And by the way, when one goes extinct, it's kind of like burning the library at Alexandria. We lose all of that information. Okay, uh, genes are in specific locations and they come in different forms. So again, this is vocabulary building. We call the place that a gene is found on a chromosome its locus. This is in classical genetics. And genes can be found in different versions. We call those different versions alleles. So for example, the gene for eye color that's either blue or brown, those would be the allele for blue or the allele for brown. If 
you are carrying two different versions of the gene. You got one from your mom and you got one from their dad and they're different, then you're a heterozygote. And we call that condition the heterozygous condition. If you got the same one from both parents, then you're a homozygote and we call that the homozygous condition. What does a gene look like? Well, there's a lot now that's known about this. And uh, as a matter of fact, I encourage you to do things like to go on the web and just type gene structure and have a look at all the diagrams that pop up. Normally, a gene has got a codon, that is, three nucleic acids that say, this is where you're going to start reading me off. And then it's got another one down at the end that's a stop codon. It says that's where you stop. And then in between that, you've got a long string of DNA. This is in eukaryotes, not in prokaryotes. You have a long string of DNA, and some of it is going to end up coding for protein, and some of it is not. So the part that will code for protein we call the exons, the part that is going to be cut out and spliced and put into messenger RNA to go out and make protein. And the part that is not, we call introns. So not all of the DNA is going to go out and become proteins. 